All right, folks, finally time to return to the 6.5 Grindle. I've got a new barrel that I want to have a look at today. This is my second attempt at trying to make this video. The last time I tried, I had trigger problems and I kept getting doubles and triples and actually quadruple firings. It was screwing up all my groups. It was making me mad and I just had to wipe the whole thing away. If that video had worked out, we would have shown the first shots through the gun and kind of gone through the break-in procedure. But that's water under the bridge now. The gun has 70 rounds on it at the start of this video, which in all honesty is probably a good thing. All right, to the barrel. I ended up going with Faxon, or is it Faxon? I want to pronounce it Faxon. When I read it, I read Faxon, but everybody seems to call it Faxon. And whenever I say Faxon, I want to say fax on, fax off. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off, yeah. In the style of Mr. Miyagi. So this fax on thing is going to take me a minute to get used to. I got their 18 inch heavy fluted match series barrel. It is a thing of beauty, very nicely made. And one of the many reasons I went with them was the weight. This guy only weighs 1.81 pounds. And looking around, that's like, that's significantly lighter than just about everybody else. I knew I wanted an 18 inch. I've got an 18 inch in 223 and I really like that length. So that's what I wanted to go with. And I guess maybe I should talk over a little bit of the history. Actually, I could go off on a little bit of a 6.5 Grendel rant here for a minute, if you don't mind. Because this cartridge seems to be gaining popularity and thriving in spite of the market. It is still an incredibly confusing thing to jump into with tons of confusion, tons of bad info out there. So let me walk you through my history with 6.5 Grindel and the way that I understand things. And I might sprinkle a little bad info in here myself because like I said, there's just so much conflicting info out there. I can never be sure whether I am believing the correct side or reading the right things because a lot of people just don't know what the hell they're talking about, including me. So I'm just going to lay it out the way I know it. I got into 6.5 Grindel almost exactly two years ago, and I decided to go with a 24 inch barrel. It was a beast. I got the 24 inch Grindel II chambered barrel from Brownells. And all the information I could find on that, and I th actually I think it's right on, on Brownell's website that the barrel was made by Saturn. So that's what I went with. I had a problem with the bolt and more specifically the extractor on the bolt. So after a little bit of Dremel work on the extractor, we got it running well and that gun shot really, really well. But over time, the big four inch, or the, yeah, the big 24 inch barrel, the gun was too heavy to be practical. I didn't want to hunt with it. It was really only good for range testing. But the cartridge itself is so awesome. I really wanted, you know, a setup that I could take deer hunting. I think this is going to be a great deer hunting setup. Like this 18 inch setup, I think it's going to be great for that. So I ended up cha uh, trading my 24 inch Brownells barrel to a viewer who had a 16 inch Saturn barrel. So we did a swap. I put the 16 inch barrel in. We did a video a few months, a few months back checking it. It seemed to shoot just fine. But shooting suppressed, it was way over gassed. Basically, any of them are going to be way over gassed if you shoot suppressed. And I needed to buy a, an adjustable gas block for it. So I tore it back apart and then never got around to getting an adjustable gas block for it. And then over time, I decided to go ahead and just buy one because, you know, with, with having the YouTube channel, I wanted to be shooting something that you can go out and buy. Like, if this works well for me, I want you to go out and be able to duplicate what I'm doing if you so choose. And another thing is I really wanted to try the Sammy chamber because like I mentioned earlier, my 24 inch Brownells barrel was a Grendel II. The Saturn barrel I traded for was originally a Sammy chamber and then ended up going back to Saturn and getting modified. I'm not sure if it's actually a Grendel II or if it, yeah. Well, let me get into that a little bit. And before I do that, let me clear up the easy one. The first thing is you go out looking for a 6.5 Grindel, you're going to see people talking about type 1 and type 2 Grindels. Or you might see the question posed, somebody talking is like, oh, is your Grindel a type 1 or a type 2? That wording, type 1 and type 2, has to do with the bolt and nothing more. 
This is a type two bolt. This is, this is my old bolt. I ended up picking up a new bolt for this guy. We'll, we'll have a look at it, at it here in just a second. This is a type two bolt. My new bolt is a type two bolt. The standard bolt for 6.5 Grendel is the type two bolt. And what that means is that it has a uh, 136 thousandths depth here on the bolt face. Grab some calipers, do a little plunge test, which is a little bit easier said than done, but it gets us pretty close. There you go, 135 and a half. So the face of this bolt is 136 thousandths deep. That is standard 6.5 Grindle. Now a type one bolt, or what, what gets called a type one bolt, is the 762 by 39 bolt which has a 125, 124, hang on. I'm, I'm, seeing both, I'm seeing people saying 124 and I'm seeing people say 125. Regardless, it is different than the Grendel bolt, which is 136. And I think this confusion and this ridiculousness is why you'll see a lot of, you know, places that sell Grendel barrels will sell you a, a properly head spaced bolt right along with it. My Brownells barrel came with a bolt actually came with this bolt. My advice on this would be to stay the hell away from type one. And pretty much all of the barrel, barrel manufacturers in their description of their barrels will tell you, they'll either say type two bolt or it'll say 136, you know, uh, 0.136 inches bolt. That's the standard. If you somehow end up with a type one, you're, you're on the weirdo side of things. So just stick with good old type two, the way the Grindel gods intended. I think some of it goes, you know, way back when, well before uh, Grindel was Sammy approved and there being problems with the bolts, right? So the, this is the, the type two bolt 136 deep is a little bit deeper than the 762 by 39 bolt. So the 762 by 39 bolt being a little shallower, I think, you know, means a little bit more material in certain places. And P some people thought that was required to get the longe you know, longevity out of bolts. There don't seem to be any bolt problems that people are reporting these days. No, but nobody's out there just breaking bolts all over the place, from what I can tell. So this bolt's just fine. There are several manufacturers, and there seem to be a lot more manufacturers now than there were two years ago, making good bolts that have good reputations. So just stick with the standard type two or 0.136 a lot of places won't specify type two. Like I'm looking at the facts on page right now and they just say 0.136 inch. But those are the two things you're looking for. Now, leaving that discussion completely, we're done with bolts. There is another confusing situation where you have the Sammy Grendel chamber and there's also a Grendel two chamber. As I mentioned before, my barrel, my, my 24 inch barrel, the first barrel I bought, sold by Brownells, made by Saturn, was a Grendel II. And now that we know what I you know, mentioned earlier about the bolts, to be more specific, it was a Type II Grendel II. This is where things are really fuzzy. But from what I can tell, Grendel gets Sammy approved, more people start making barrels, more barrels start making their way out to people and people were having feeding issues with some of the factory ammo on the market. And it all ended up being throat lead related, throat related. The Sammy Grindle has got a compound throat, which I'm still not completely clear about what the heck's going on there. But from what I can tell, the throat there, the lead, the part before the rifling starts is not parallel to the bore. It's got a couple angles and those angles are to help align the bullet as it approaches the rifling, I think. And from what I understand, the Grindle has a pretty big neck. The chamber, the Sammy Grindle chamber, has got a lot of excess space in the neck because it's got this compound throat that's gonna help with alignment, so the neck didn't need to be quite as tight as it might otherwise be. Well, what happened was the barrels get out there, people start having problems with chambering factory ammunition. I don't know if it was jamming into the rifling or whether this compound throat was somehow causing problems. So what Saturn did, I think it was Saturn's fault, is they got rid of the compound throat and they made a parallel throat. 
They also seem to have really stretched that throat out because my Brownells barrel definitely had a nice long throat, bit of a giraffe throat. So they went with this parallel and long throat and that cured the problems. And they called this the Grendel II. Back when I bought my first barrel, the prevailing opinion of the places I was researching said that that was the way to go. Just get you a Grendel II, it'll be more compatible with more ammo, and they still shoot just fine. However, there were a lot of other people who were really kind of hacked off about it, and you just kind of had to pick a side. Like, okay, who am I going to believe here? I got a Grendel II, and you know what? It shot pretty darn well. So I don't have a whole lot to complain about. But now that I come back to the market two years later, opinion seems to have shifted. Now there seems to be a lot of people saying, stay away from that Grendel II, just stick with the Sammy Grendel chamber just the way it was intended. So somewhere along the way, I decided that my next barrel would be a Sammy barrel. Because you know what? I, I tried margarine. It tasted pretty well, but I want to try some real butter. You can't say you prefer Miracle Whip if you've never tried mayonnaise. So that's where I'm at. This is, this is my butter. Because as far as I can tell, facts on chambers in Sammy Grendel standard Sammy specs. Their website even says Sammy Chamber. So that's why I decided to go the way that I went. I have already found some pretty darn drastic differences in the chamber of this gun and the two other barrels I've owned. And we'll get to that here in just a minute. But that's the market as I see it. And as far as I know, Grendel 2, unless you're ordering from uh, Saturn or Brownells, I don't know of any other major barrel manufacturers that are definitely chambering, chambering in Grendel 2. There are places where you can get basically whatever you want. I even found one place that sold a Type 1 Grendel 2, which is truly an abomination. Assuming you're like me and just kind of, like I, I just want the normal Grendel. Just give me what a Grendel is supposed to be. And that's, it, it just, it makes for an incredibly confusing market to get into. And I'm really surprised that it continues to seem to be growing in popularity because I'm sure at least some people are just turned off by the whole thing and say, screw it, I'll go another direction. But this is a Type 2 Bolt Sammy Grendel, as far as I know. Actually, just a couple days ago, somebody had commented on one of my videos saying they were having problems with feeding some Grendel factory ammo in their gun. And I think they were shooting like the... The 90 or 95 grain VMAX, a very light varmint bullet. And I think maybe that's another thing that ends up causing people's people issues is you've got barrel makers trying to make barrels that are going to fit all of this different stuff. But I want a Grendel to shoot 123 grain bullets, some 120s, maybe some 129s. We're going to test out a 135 today. And these are the big, long, skinny high ballistic coefficient bullets. And when you put something, actually another bullet we're gonna be testing today, the 130 grain Sierra Game King, a short little squat bullet with a super fat ogive, compared to one of these skinny little guys, you can see where throat issues might be a problem. And uh, yeah, I think the barrel that, uh, the person who had made the comment the other day was working with was an Odinworks, and like I said, he was shooting a 95 grain VMAX and it was hitting the, sounded like it was hitting the lands. It wasn't a major ammo manufacturer. It was some, it was a small ammo shop sort of thing. So I guess they just didn't test their ammo in all of the barrels on the market to make sure that, you know, the overall length they went with was going to feed. And he didn't reload. So he didn't have a press where he could just, you know, maybe seat him a little bit deeper. So he was screwed. But this is where these things, this is actually 129 grain uh, Nosler Acubon long range. These sorts of bullets are where it shines. And, you know, if you want to shoot light bullets for varmints, just stick with 223 would, would probably be my uh, recommendation there. Now, onto the differences. This ammo right here, I've got almost a whole box of this ammo loaded up. I had worked up a load to take hog hunting with me, and these are the leftovers. These will not chamber in this gun. But in this case, it has to do with headspace. Let me get my headspace comparator. Here's a piece of brass that was fired in my old barrel. So this is a fire-formed piece of brass. 
and they always read 1.224. So my reloaded ammo, I think this is probably like 1.221 or 1.22, uh, 1.220. This brass was fired. Yeah, this brass has been fired in my new barrel. 1.214. There is 10 thousandths of headspace difference between this barrel and my Saturn barrels. That is a lot. That's almost enough to where if you took your Type 2 bolt with a 136 depth and switched to the 762 by 39 bolt, that's what, 11 or 12 thousandths shallower, it probably still would have worked. You know, th this bolt was sent to me as being properly headspaced. Like this bolt came with the barrel. So I just, I never questioned it. The full-length sizing die that I've always used has been this guy. This, what the hell is wrong with my camera? It is all jacked up today. Eh, let's try that, a little bit darker. There we go. So this is my Forster full-length sizing die for 6.5 Grindel. I thought this thing was crap. Well, I mean, it's a really nice die and it works well, but I thought it was cut all wrong. Because, you know, normally full-length sizing die, you screw it down until it touches your shell holder and that gets you pretty close. You know, sometimes you have to take it down a little bit until you bump that shoulder just the way you want it. This guy, I had to take it down until it touched and then back it out a little bit. It, it oversized, it bumped the shoulder way too much. Way, way, way too much. And I always thought it was Forster's fault. But guess what I find out? You know, here's my new gun with my 1.215 brass, or I think it was 1.214 earlier, whatever. You get the point right there. Now with this brass, if I take this fulling sizing die and screw it down until it touches and then make it nice and tight, it's perfect. Bumps the shoulder two thousandths, I get like 1.213 or something like that after sizing. So this new barrel matches my Forster fulling sizing die the way things should work. And I'm happy to be on the normal end of things now, right? Like I said, my my Grindel 2 chambers seem to shoot just fine, but I don't want the weird thing, right? I want the standard thing. Just give me the freaking standard thing. And it just aggravates me that the market for a really great cartridge has been confused and muddied and made to be ridiculous. Now, the bolt I always wanted to buy, but I never did because I already had a bolt that we had modified and made to work just fine. was the Maxim. I ended up, I went ahead and bought a Maxim bolt. So 75 bucks just for the bolt itself. Not the cheapest thing in the world, but back two years ago, it was this bolt and the JP bolt were the two that everybody said were just excellent. And the JP bolt is about $8 million. And then this guy was 75 bucks, but I could just never justify buying one when I had another bolt that I had, uh, gotten working. This guy's got, you know, several thousand rounds on it now, and it's to the point where now I'm starting to worry about it, right? Like that extractor is going to wear a little too much at some point and whatever. I could justify buying a spare finally, or buying a new one and making that guy the spare. So the Maxim bolt is going in. I'll tell you right now, the 70 rounds from the previous video I've already put through this barrel, and the 100 rounds for today's video that I've already put through this barrel I haven't had a single ejection problem of any sort or any type of type of problem that would be related to the uh, to the bolt. So it's looking like the Maxim bolt is doing just as well as I always thought it would. So I'll throw a link down in the description for that guy. I, I would have bought a bolt from uh, Faxon, but all they sold was the complete bolt carrier group, and I just wanted a bolt. So I went with the Maxim. Holy crap, back to the barrel. This video is going to be an hour and a half long and it is going to be nothing but me ranting, uh, ranting and raving like a freaking lunatic, unless I get started here. This guy does have a mid-length gas system. I was really hoping to get one with a rifle length gas system. Like I said, I shoot suppressed. My old Grindles were way over gassed and the action, you know, just uh, ran a little harder than I'd like. So I thought maybe the rifle length gas system would be the better choice, but mid-length it is. That's what they sell. I think Odinworks has a rifle. Yeah, I thought Odinworks was rifle length, but it looks like they're uh, intermediate gas as well. Or, I don't know. 
I don't even know what the hell intermediate gas means. I don't know if that's a mid-length gas system, the kind of standardized mid-length gas system, or if it's some Odenworks specific thing, but whatever, man. The good thing is that it doesn't have a carbine link gas system. That would be bad. Those are out there, and I would stay away from them if I were you. This guy had an itty bitty gas port. Tiny. Yeah, it looked like a .075. The 16 Saturn barrel I've got on hand was like a .092, the best I could measure. But like I said, I did go ahead and put a Odenworks tunable gas block, one of their cheaper adjustable gas blocks on here. Now, what was lost in the last video was when I started, when I first started shooting it, I had the gas, the adjustable gas block wide open. I had a standard carbine buffer and spring and I wanted to test it out that way first, and it ran just fine. I had zero function problems. Then I went up to a heavier buffer and started tuning on the gas block, and that's where it sits right now. I'm running a JP Silent Capture Spring with three tungsten weights, so this is like an H3 equivalent. And I've actually tuned the gas system all the way down to where it just locks the bolt back when I've, when I've got the suppressor on. So in some of today's shooting footage, when I'm shooting unsuppressed, it, it, it doesn't even work the action. It doesn't even eject. So I probably need to rethink that. I need to turn up the gas a little bit to where, you know, it's fine if it doesn't lock the bolt back, but I at least need it to be able to cycle ammo without the suppressor. That would probably be the smart move. Another thing I've got that may eventually find its way into this, uh, into this gun is an extra heavy, about an extra heavy buffer from like uh, stupidheavybuffers.com or you know whatever heavybuffers.com and a wolf extra power spring so if it still seems to be under buffered as i go along i might go ahead and throw this beast in there this is in the same upper configuration that the 24 inch gun was in it's the gibbs side charging upper uh, midwest industries rail same bolt carrier group and everything or the same bolt carrier as the old one the, the new bolt is in there but yeah this is the old same old bolt carrier we've been running in 6.5 grindle all along and even the same muzzle device it is a silencer co brake that i haven't quite got it timed right you can see it tilting tilting upward a little bit but i've always got the suppressor on there and it's really just a uh it's just a suppressor adapter for me so i'm probably not even going to worry about timing it Got the same uh, 6 to 24 by 50 Vortex Viper PST scope in an odd mount base. Same stuff we've been shooting on Grendel all along since day one. All right, let's, let's start throwing some ammo at this guy. In the last video that you never got to see because of the trigger issues, I shot the 123 grain Sierra Match King and the 123 grain Lapua Sinar. And like I, well, you know, the trigger problems were causing problems. And also, once I decided to ditch the video, I spent a bunch of time playing with my gas block. And to, with the hand guard I've got on there and the Allen wrench I had on hand, I actually had to remove my stupid hand guard every time I wanted to make an adjustment. So most of the groups weren't good, but I didn't really care. I wasn't really shooting for groups all that much at that point. I was mainly tuning for function. But I did end up shooting one pretty nice group. It was with the 123 grain Lapua CNR and Vitavori N135 at 25.0 grains. No pressure signs. The velocity was around 2260 feet per second. So, you know, nice low velocity. We actually shot up to 26 grains. It was about 2350 feet per second and didn't have any pressure signs. So I decided to load up a bunch of this load for today's test, the 25 grains of N135. So that's kind of going to be our main cider load and testing load is this guy right here. Now, some of my other tests here, I also shot 8208 XBR and TAC. The, some of the accuracy on TAC wasn't terrible, not good but not terrible, and the, the velocities, especially with 8208 80, especially with 8208XBR, I ended up getting up to around 2450 feet per second. And I think I did, yeah, and I think 28 grains was over pressure, but whatever, it was showing pressure signs, but it looks like we're gonna be able to get some decent velocity here with the 18 inch barrel. I was worried 
coming from that big long 24 that the 18 the velocity was just going to be awful so as we go you know we'll be working up seeing how much velocity we can get out of this 18 inch barrel over time but i don't think it'll be too bad the other problem i ran into in the last video that uh had to be aborted was the brass i didn't realize how janky my stockpile of brass had gotten so i ended up ordering 100 pieces of new brass brass is a little tough to find right now I was going to go with Lapua, but I couldn't find it anywhere, so I stuck with Hornady. I bought 100 pieces, and then like two days later, a viewer got in touch with me. He had picked up some at a, uh, I think it was a Gander Mountain, was going out of business, and he got some on sale that he sent to me as well. So I've got 200 pieces of new brass now, and we're ready to start rolling. And like I said, our, our main load here, our first load is going to be the 123 grain Lapua Cinar with 25 grains of Vitivori N135. It's gonna be all Vitivori today. I just decided to let's just shoot all Vitivori. We're gonna shoot, we're gonna shoot bullets from 95 grains all the way up to 135 grains. And we're gonna use Vitivori N133, N135, and N140. But to start out here, it's 25 grains of N135. The overall length is 2.260. We're using CCI 450 primers. We're using brand new Hornady brass. I've got three 10 shot groups that I want to show you here first. The first group is the bare barrel, 10 shots. The second group, I'm going to put on my suppressor and take 10 shots. And then the third group, I'm going to add in my magneto speed chronograph on the suppressor. I wanted to characterize how much uh, change we're, we, we see in the groups and how much uh, point of impact shift we get with these devices hanging off the barrel. So let's head out, look at those 30 shots, and then we'll come back and talk about the results. So that was a dramatic shift with the suppressor. I saw the same thing in my previous shots with this gun, and that's why I wanted to kind of do this target to characterize it as closely as I could. It's looking like a four inch shift downward between non, you know, unsuppressed and suppressed. Also a dramatic tightening of the groups. Now, when we put the chronograph on there, we got an additional maybe half inch of shift downward, but the groups stayed pretty close to pretty close to one another. Listen, these back back to back eight eight, eight to half, or these back to back point eight five ish groups. That is really good stuff. I am super happy with that. So extremely happy with accuracy here with the suppressor on, but without the suppressor, it was just bad. Two point two inches. Now. I didn't have my camera over far enough to catch it, but once I was done with those, I still had five shots left of that ammo, and I took the suppressor back off and said, I wanna shoot one more group just to double check. And this is what I got with that. So point of impact shifted right back up where it was supposed to, and the group immediately got crappy again. 
1.54 inches there with only five shots. Now the question I had here, this is one load, right? This is one, you know, one powder charge with one bullet. So the question is, is this gonna hold true all the time? So I tested this same thing with a couple more bullets and we'll, we'll get, that, get that here in just one second. One thing I do wanna mention, when I started out there, I was shooting this guy. This is a 10 round AR stoner magazine. This guy's done. It was causing problems with my old gun, some feeding problems. I wanted to try it in this guy. It, it's not as bad as it was with my old gun, but it's still pretty bad. I did have a jam. Uh, failure to feed of one sort or another. So I switched back over to this guy. This is uh, this is an Alexander Arms magazine, or I think on this side it says Elander. So I switched back to this dude and didn't have any more problems at all. So the way the gas block is set, as long as I was suppressed and I was using this magazine, no feeding problems whatsoever today. So that was that was the 123 grain Lapua. The next two bullets I want to test. I loaded up 10 rounds with the 123 grain Sierra Match King, and also the 123 grain Hornady ELD Match. Exact same powder charge, 25 grains of N135. Now my plan was to shoot a 10 shot group with these guys, but once I saw the results we saw with our suppressor shift test, I wanted to go ahead and break those 10 rounds that I loaded into two five shot groups. One with the suppressor and one without the suppressor. So that's what I wanna show you now. The first 10 shots are gonna be without the suppressor. It's 10 shots of the, or five shots of the Sierra Match King, then five shots with the Hornady. Then I put the suppressor on, go back to the Match King, and then back to the Hornady. Now, unfortunately with the Hornady, well, you know, when I, when I took the suppressor off, of course, our point of impact shifted back upwards and it landed right on top of the target above it. it, it the target actually says uh, 135 burger. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. So I'll send you out to look at those four groups. So unfortunately, two of the shots for the for the Match King without the suppressor went off the paper. So you only saw three holes up there. Two of them completely missed the paper. But we definitely saw the, you know, just about the same amount of shift, about four inches high. The Sierra Match King group, the five shot group with the suppressor really wasn't all that great. 1.29 inches, a little bit disappointing. When I was filming the previous video, I kind of saw the same thing. The Match King just doesn't seem to be doing it with this barrel. But the 123 grain ELD match looks like it's a better performer for us. Same amount of shift upward, but here the groups were a whole lot closer. You know, so the, the unsuppressed group was one inch and the suppressed group was 0.753. So the suppressed was still better, but the difference wasn't nearly as much as we saw with the Lapua. So that, that gives me hope that it's just a load thing probably. So if you subscribe to the barrel whip, barrel time, resonant frequency, that sort of uh, thoughts when it comes to load development, which, which I, I do. Hopefully it means that we just happen to land on a load with the Lapua where the, the naked barrel was way outside in the crappy area. But once we threw the suppressor on there, we were right in the sweet spot. We'll probably, we'll have to be doing, we'll have to do some more testing on that. But I'm glad to see that it is at least, you know, 
It's getting better with the suppressor, not worse. I do like to shoot suppressed pretty much all the time. So if it was the other way around, like we threw the suppressor on and the groups went to crap, I would be a very upset person right now. But I know a lot of you guys don't shoot suppressed. So we'll investigate it a little bit more as we go. The next few Grindle videos we do, I'll try to do a, a suppressed versus unsuppressed test. Maybe, you know, in each video or something, just to kind of continue building on the information we have about that. I'm not all that excited about this crazy, you know, four inch drop though, that I'm seeing. I've been lucky so far. Pretty much all of the other guns I own, I screw on the suppressor and it's pretty close. The new 6.5 Creedmoor I just got has got some shift down and to the right, but it's not quite as bad as this. This is four inches. And it surprises me, like th this is their heavy barrel, right? This is their heavy fluted barrel. So I guess I just expected it to maybe be more rigid, but I, I don't think rigidity really has all that much to do with it maybe, I don't know. But any of you guys that own this barrel or one of the Faxon barrels, I'd be interested to hear what your results have been if you shoot a suppressor or maybe you shoot some big mo uh, monster muzzle device. Let me know what your results have been. Now the next bullet I wanna test or I want to show you is the 135 grain Burger Classic Hunter. I shot just a few of these in uh, my 6.5 Creedmoor the other day and they were very impressive. So I wanted to give them a try here in the Grendel. I will warn you, I, I don't know how useful they'll actually be as a hunting bullet. I went to a slower powder. So I did switch over to Vitivory N140. Vitivory does have some Grendel data, mainly with uh, Lapua bullets. So I was kind of just pulling a charge weight out of my butt, trying to figure out what sort of uh, you know charge we could shoot without hitting pressure too bad. And I actually did end up hitting a little bit of pressure, but we were only at 2,187 feet per second. So a better powder selection and a little bit more load workup, like, I don't know, let's say we get it to 2,250 feet per second maybe, or 2,200. Maybe we could get faster than that, I don't know. But the point I'm trying to get to here is that, you know, I think this bullet is really made for the big boy cartridges. And it probably has a, you know, minimum expansion velocity or a recommended velocity for acceptable terminal performance of like 1800 feet per second. So if we're, at all, we're only at 2200 and our useful range ends when, you know, where we hit 1800 feet per second, then at best, this is probably gonna be like a 200 yard bullet. Which in my case, you know, I hunt woodlands in Kentucky that's totally fine. I don't take shots beyond that. But if you're looking to shoot antelope at 700 yards, this is not gonna be the right choice, right? Where you're gonna to wanna to go low, uh, lighter bullets, get that velocity up there to extend that range. So just, just throwing that warning out there before we get to this guy. Now, the unfortunate thing about this group is our previous group with the ELD match without the suppressor landed right on the spot for this bullet. So this group is right on top of the group for the ELD. So I'll try to like add in maybe some dots or something that show the hits for our burger as we go. So let's go have a look at that group. Man, if it wasn't for that second shot that went just a little bit right, that would have been an outstanding group. As it is, it was still, it was a 672. And I consider that excellent for, you know, made up load data. I mean, if there's any bullet we've shot today that makes me think that, you know, we could work up a ridiculously accurate load, that's the one. Because it was four shots in one hole and then one outside so if we could just get rid of that one that's outside that would be very impressive that'll probably be our next video here like you know this this is this video is just a mess i'm, I'm doing nothing but rambling and ranting about the 6.5 grindle market you know like dang the next video where we actually kind of slow things down test some bullets in a more controlled manner will be this guy i want to shoot these guys i want to pick out a couple powders that maybe we can really get some good velocity with. N140 is pretty slow, right? That's uh, it's a pretty slow burning powder, but I'm wondering, you know, if we go even slower, or at least I think it's slower, 
the ball powders that really, really give the excellent velocity in Grendel, like Lever Evolution and CFE 223, right? Generally see better accuracy with extruded powders in general. But maybe we'll land on, you know, a magic load with one of those ball powders where we can really get some good velocity with this guy without getting too much pressure. Because like I said, I built this 18-inch gun to hunt with, and this is a this is a contender. I also have some uh, ballistic gel, so I might be able to just put a block of ballistic gel out at 250 yards and shoot some of these at it and see if we're still getting good expansion. That sounds like a fun test. So a lot more to come with the 135 grain Classic Hunter. It looks good here in Grindle. It looked excellent in my recent Creedmoor video. You know, these things are stupid expensive. I think I'm gonna go ahead and pick up another box to have more to test with because it seems like they're, they might just be worth it. So there are two more bullets that I wanna show you groups with. And then there's a couple that I'm not even gonna show you because they were so disappointing. We'll just talk over the groups. The first one I wanna show you is the 130 grain Sierra Game King. There's a 135 grain Game King with a very similar design that I've been testing in 300 Blackout and ran into some feeding problems. These have a very blunt tip. You know, the hollow point is quite large. It's got a, a little bit of a, a jagged meat plat here. So I thought this would be a really good, uh, really good uh, test for our feed ramps to see how they're gonna run. And these also shot pretty darn decent in my 6.5 Creedmoor. Now, this is a 130 grain bullet, a little bit lighter. This is another excellent choice, I'm thinking, for a hunting bullet, for a deer hunting bullet for, uh, for the Grendel. We can get a little bit more velocity than we could get with the 135 Burger. So may maybe it'd be a good one, I don't know yet. So with this guy, I stuck with Vitivory N140 and I bumped the charge weight up a half grain. So 27.5 grains of N140 and shooting an overall length of 2.135. This is what Sierra has on their load data. Oh, and I should mention that Sierra just released load data for 6.5 Grendel on their website, just like a couple weeks ago. So I'll have that link down in the description so you can check it out. They've got, uh, they've got data for all sorts of stuff. Let me double check it. Yeah, they go 85 up to 130. So this 130 grain bullet is the heaviest they have load data for. It looks like they've got seven different powders. So definitely worth checking out. And they, like I said, they go with a 2.135 inch overall length. So that's what I went with. The other guy is the 129 grain Hornady SST. This guy, I wanna shoot, uh, you know, the overall length 2.260 with this guy, but I wanna shoot the same charge weight we're shooting with the, with the 130 Sierra, 27.5 grains of N140. And both of these ended up giving me about 2,250 feet per second. 2,249 with the SST and 2,269 with the, uh, with the Sierra. I did see some light pressure signs, but they weren't, they weren't horrible. So let, yeah, let's go out and have a look at those two groups and then we'll be done with uh, range time. All right, so these are some more good looking groups. 0.774 inches with the Sierra, 0.811 with the Hornady SST. That's good stuff. So, I mean, and it's, it's a bit of a surprise. So far of all the bullets we've shown, the 123 grain Sierra Match King seems to be the one this gun just doesn't really like. I found that very surprising. My 24 inch gun shot the, shot the Sierras better than, uh, well, definitely better than the Hornady's. It shot the Lapua's really well, but yeah, regardless, I'm just, I'm surprised that the Sierras don't seem to be grouping quite as well as the rest, but you know, it might just be a matter of finding the right powder, trying some different things, seeing what it likes. Now this is where, this is the point where everything just goes to crap. I shot three more bullets. I shot the 120 grain Barnes Tac TX. I shot the 100 grain Barnes TTSX. 
and I shot the 95 grain Lehigh Defense Controlled Chaos. I really screwed up the load data. Like, I, I really screwed it up. I had pressure signs with all of them. I went to Vitivory N133. I probably should have stuck with N135, but I went with N133, and these groups are awful. The 120 grain barns shot a 2.89 inch group, just throwing them all over the place here. The 100 grainer, it was trying to group, but it threw one super high and ended up being the worst group of all at 3.55 inches. The Lehigh was the best of those three with this 2.14 inch group. I just, I, I have never had any luck with copper solids. Or in Lehigh's case, that's a brass solid. I, I see way too much of this, this sort of crap. And I think it's on me, right? I think I just don't know how to load them. I don't have enough experience with them. I have managed to get some good performance in 300 Blackout with some of the big ones, like the uh, like the big Lehigh Defense Bullet. I killed a deer with that guy. Or no, I was using the Maker. The Maker Rex is another big, heavy bullet I've, I've shot in 300 Blackout and got some acceptable performance from. But when I try them in the higher velocity uh, types of loadings like these, I always end up with crap groups. You know, at some point here on the channel, I have to maybe investigate that a little bit more and figure out what my problems are because you know, I know a lot of you guys well, like California right I mean you, you you can't use lead bullets anymore right for hunting and I'm sure it's just a matter of time before that migrates to other states and we're all kind of uh, trying to figure out how to make these guys shoot but so far I've just I've just had some pretty epic failures and this is just adding to the list. Like I said, I was over pressure on all three. I, like, I, I don't even want to take the time to edit the footage and show you and make a little graphic and tell you the load and all of that. I, I was shooting like 25, 27, and 28 grains of N133. And all I ended up with was brand new brass that now has pressure signs and might need scrapped. So definitely don't take my word on charge weights there for those, but man, I cannot wait to try that Barnes again. That was almost such a good group. Just that one little dude there screwed it up. Happy with the performance of the Hornadies. The my, my 24 inch barrel never seemed to want to shoot the Hornadies. Like I've got I've got boxes of the 123 grain A Max, which the 123 A Max and the 123 ELD match. I was looking at them again just the other day. They're the same freaking bullet. They just put the new tip in the ELD match. There's a couple thousandths of difference in length and a couple thousandths of difference in base to ogive distance, but I think it's just lot number variation. But you can't buy the Amax anymore. So the Amax, I'll probably use those as ciders in the background because I doubt any videos specifically on those would be very popular at this point since you can't buy them. So yeah, I'll figure out some way to use them. But yeah, very happy with the the 123 ELD was a 753, and then the 129 SST was an 811. I didn't have any of the 123 grain SSTs left. I need to pick up some more of those. That would really be the best option for hunting bullet for this gun, right? They're, they're inexpensive, and if it'll shoot them like it's shooting the ELDs, that'll be a good thing. Because I think people are seeing pretty good terminal performance out there with those, with those guys. So, so far so good. With the Faxon 18 inch match series heavy fluted. This guy is uh, $319, so a little bit pricey. If they offered this guy without the fluting, that's what that's what I would have went with. I kind of wish they had like a maybe a $275 model that didn't have the fluting. They have uh, what they call their gunner profile. Like this, like I said, this is a pretty thick profile, but it's so light. I, I cannot I can't explain to you how much lighter this is. Then even my 18 inch uh, white oak armament 223, like this is a significant weight savings. And I don't know how much of it is down to fluting, but it must be quite a bit of it, I would think. You know, I shot a total of 100 rounds through it today. I took my time, like I was out there three or four hours on the range, but it never seemed to get hot. Like it, it, it never, heat was never a problem. And especially with like those 10, 10 shot groups, like looking at them as the group progressed, I didn't see any stringing that might be related to, you know, as the barrel was heating up across the 10 shots. So I'm hoping it will be for, be forgiving with barrel heat. 
But ab above all else, you know, with, with my own experience with 6.5 Grendel, it was so frustrating building that first gun and then getting out there and having extraction problems and having to take Dremel tools to extractors and feeling like you had just bought something and been shipped crap that wouldn't that wouldn't work and never could have worked. And there's none of that here. The bolt worked great. The chamber seems great, nice and tight. Oh, that's another thing I, I wanted to mention. Well, I've shot all this brass. I, I could go get, hang on. Yeah, let me go get another piece of new brass. Yeah, so here's a here's a new piece of brass straight out of a package. Hopefully this doesn't backfire on me here, but <laughs> reading like a 1.212 headspace. And then if we go to the brass I fired today, 1.214, 1.215. So I have a nice tight chamber. I finally feel like I have the chamber that I was always supposed to have. Because that was another frustration, getting started with reloading for this cartridge. You know, back to the Saturn, the Grendel 2 brass. Except 1.222. What was this new stuff? Yeah, 1.212. So with that chamber, new brass was getting, the shoulder was getting blown forward 10,000. And I had to set my resizing die all weird. So it finally feels like I have an actual Grendel that no one has screwed with. So I think that's where we'll leave it. After watching this crap video, I can't imagine why you'd want to, but if you want to help support my channel, you can come to patreon.com slash reloading. You can also click on my affiliate links down in the description if you're going shopping. And I actually do have an affiliate account with Faxon. That was another reason why I kind of went with Faxon. I was also considering Odinworks and trying to think of who else I was uh, seriously considering. Several people making good Grendel barrels, but I thought, hey, if this Faxon works out great and I can talk you into buying one, I can give you a link and get a little referral fee, but if it shoots like crap, you might want to hold off on that. Yeah, hold off on that link until maybe a couple videos down the road. We'll see for sure whether this guy's going to run, but, or I guess whether it's going to be accurate. At this point, I've got plenty of rounds through it where I feel very good about how it functions and how it runs and how it, you know, ran in the standard configuration, like I said, that I tried where gas block all the way open Standard carbine buffer and spring ran ran just fine. So I've, I haven't had any function problems until I started causing them myself by screwing with the gas. And then today, a few uh, problems that were 100% caused by the magazine. That, that's like the last, whenever I was filming the last video, I never even pulled this magazine out because I knew it was bad. But I wanted to try it today just to see if it's still bad. See if it's bad in this gun as well. And it is. This one's going in the trash. So, all right, that's, that's it. I'll see you guys next time.